Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to episode 134 of Making It With Me, your host, Terry Wallman. I really appreciate you joining us every week, and I say that every week because I mean it from the heart. I'd like to start off by thanking Mark of the Unicorn and Blue Microphones for their technical support and continuing to bring our show to you during this world health pandemic. Please continue to stay mindful and safe as we all work together as a global community. You can find all of our episodes on entertalkmedia.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or just go to terrywalman.com slash podcast. I hope you'll find my recent conversations with artists Gino Vanelli, Tony Basil, and drummers Peter Erskine, Joe Vitale, and today, guest artist Roger Brown, inspiring, entertaining, and comforting. I created this show to focus on what it takes to maintain a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business, and I'd like to start off by telling you about my guest. Roger H. Brown is the president of Berklee College of Music. Since his appointment in 2004, he has led Berklee during a period of unparalleled expansion. Brown has overseen the creation of the world's largest online music education system, the construction of Boston campus's first custom-built building, and the acquisition of New York's iconic Power Station Studio to create Berklee NYC, a state-of-the-art recording facility and a hub of education and creativity. He also completed a merger with the Boston Conservatory to establish the world's most comprehensive training ground for global careers in music, dance, and theater. Brown is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Davidson College and a graduate of the Yale School of Management. Roger Brown, welcome to Making It. Thank you, Terry. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you taking the time. I would imagine that this is probably an extremely busy time for you at a time where a lot of people are secluded and sequestered. Without work, you are secluded and sequestered, forging ahead in this new era, which fortunately you've already been in because you're ahead of the curve. And that's part of the reason I wanted to talk to you. I think it's important to talk about how Berkeley is a world leader in education is adjusting to keeping their students safe and on course while they continue their studies. And I'm also interested in talking about your personal journey from Gainesville to Kenya, Yale to Save the Children in Sudan, to Berkeley in 2004, and how this last year of your presidency is nothing like any of us could ever have imagined. Well, thanks for having me. And it's an honor to be on the same show as people like Abe Laboreal and Gino Vanelli and Peter Erskine, many of my heroes. Um, so, uh, I think what you're doing is great. Thank you. Uh, this is a strange time. Uh, the world is totally upside down in many ways. Some of us are struggling to find things to do. And some of us are so busy. We hardly have time to breathe. Uh, it's a welcome respite from thousands of zoom and WebEx calls and millions of decisions that need to be made just to talk a little bit about music and education. So I'm happy to be with you, Terry. Great. Well, I hope this hour brings you some comfort and also to our audience and and also hopefully a little bit of inspiration and entertainment as well. Yeah. Let me start by just a, an abridged quote from Quincy Jones, one of many students, myself included, who have gone to Berkeley. He was there in 1951, I believe, and then uh, was honored in 1983. So this is a shorter version of this quote. It has been an incredible honor to know Roger throughout his time as president of Berkeley, and I can attest to the fact that he has helped to cultivate a community of true musicians because he himself is a true musician and an all-around great human being. Big time love and props to you, my brother, from another mother who has always been there ready to care and willing to share. Thank you for your dedication and filling this world with a bit more love and music. God bless you. That's very sweet. Well, if you had told me when I was a kid growing up in Gainesville, Georgia, that someday Quincy Jones would, would A, know me and know me well enough to say nice things about me, I, would have, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, so it has truly been an amazing journey. And 
he, I think, is so emblematic of what Berkeley's all about. Someone who could play jazz at a very high level, who could arrange and orchestrate, who could do film compositions, who could run a record label, <clears throat> and then be the most successful popular music producer of all time <clears throat> and still be a great guy. And I think that that's, uh, that's what Berkeley's all about, creating people who are, who are so deeply musical that whatever they set their hearts to, they can, they can, uh, they can achieve. Uh, he's one in a million, but there are a lot of amazing Berkeley alums out there who have that ecumenical skill set and are open to music of all kinds and all styles. So it's very heartwarming to hear those words again. Yeah, I can imagine. And, and I can relate too. And, you know, yeah. and by the way, I appreciate that you added the one of the qualities of, of Quincy is a good guy. He's, he's a good person. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I've read about you quite a bit that has made me look forward to finally meeting you after all the, the years that you've been working at the school. Because one of the words that comes up often when I hear about you, besides all of your many amazing journeys and stories around the world, then we'll talk about some of them, <laughs> um, and varied skill set that you have is that the word heart always comes up it seems and when i hear people speak about you that there's you bring heart to what you do that you're not just that it's not just the academia you know and i i really um i applaud you for your ability to still remain a musician you're a drummer and a good one i've heard you play and oh really yes well, i wouldn't go that far I, I used to think i was pretty good until i took this job at berkeley and started meeting the vinnie Colaudas and harvey masons of the world well i i remember my very first day at berkeley like looking around and hearing some other people and actually really considering packing up my car and driving back to miami i was yeah. it was pretty overwhelming and intimidating yeah. but i'm i'm grateful that i had the courage to tough it out but I'm impressed that you're able to, to find balance somehow, that you still can pick up the sticks and sit at a kit and have some fun with it and mm -hmm. create some joy and experience some joy from playing with a, what I would imagine is an extremely busy schedule running one of the top music institutions in the world. How do you balance all of that and be a family man and, and yeah. everything that you do? Well, before I was at Berkeley, I was an entrepreneur. And before I was an entrepreneur, I was running refugee camps. And those are, those are three things that are associated with workaholism and no boundaries and no limits. And, and I, it has always been important to me to, to have balance in my life, to be in relationship with people I care about and invest in those relationships. And of course, things get out of balance from time to time. But, um, uh, I think, honestly, the people who brag about how hard they work are just not very good at delegating, managing, and leading. Hmm. When you're working too hard, it's your own fault, usually. I mean, there are exceptions to that. All of us have to make a push every now and then. Um, and I think if you're a person who does things all by yourself, like you write novels or s something like that, then it may be different. But when you're working in collaboration with other people, if you're working too much, you're probably not as effective as you should be. And the beautiful thing about humankind is that if you ask someone else to help you nine times out of 10, not only are they willing to help you, but they're flattered that you asked them. So part of what I've learned is uh, don't try to do it all yourself. Have the humility to say there are probably a million people who can do this thing better than you anyway. So why not find those people and ask them to help you? And then lo and behold, they join you on your journey, sort of like uh, like uh, the Wizard of Oz with mm -hmm. Dorothy, you know, <laughs> where she collects the scarecrow and the tin man and the lion. They become her her posse, mm -hmm. and together they do things they couldn't have done alone. I would imagine in your experience in all the businesses that you've done and the philanthropy and the traveling around the world, besides running Berkeley with a great team of people is that your experience has been similar to mine in that you have learned that when you allow people to help you, you are actually giving them a gift. You're not just taking and receiving something. You're actually, that's a gesture of giving. Absolutely. I, I think it's one of the most empowering things. I mean, put yourself on the other side of it. If someone calls you up and says, Terry, I love the way you arrange 
can you do, can you help me with this? Your first reaction is, wow, somebody really thinks I'm good at arranging. I, I, I'm flattered. I'd love to help. Obviously, you you know, you don't want to be exploited or someone use that in a, in a disingenuous way. Mm-hmm. But I think we all want to be wanted and needed and appreciated. And, and I actually think some of the most satisfying things in the world are projects where it's hard to know who did what. Mm-hmm. It's successful in the end, but it's hard to say whose idea was it or who contributed the most. It's just such a team process and everybody's in it for the, for the, you know, the, the goal, the mission itself, that, that the whole issue of who's leading, who has the ideas, who has the power becomes less relevant. I'm glad you said that because one of the things I wanted to ask you about today was collaboration, the art of collaboration and how you would define what collaboration is. And you've, you've just started expressing that. And I think about it always first in terms of music, but it absolutely reaches out into every aspect in life from this conversation you and I are having right now to running a major educational institution. Yeah. I would say that the, the, the experience of being in bands my whole life uh, from when I was in elementary school, I was always an active part of the band, but I've never been in a band where I was the leader and everyone else was the side person nor have I been the side person. I, a couple of times I was just uh, just the drummer in the band, but mo- most of the time it was a collective of people who had to decide what tunes we're going to play, how we're going to arrange them, how we're going to get gigs, you know, how we're going to manage the money. And, and so this idea of a collective where there isn't hierarchical leadership is a really great experience in learning how to, how to get things done without having to order people around or use authority. And I, I've always felt like even when you're the president of an organization like Berkeley, if you can't persuade most people that your idea makes sense, you probably shouldn't do it, even though you might have the power to do it. Like, you know, you can you can be insistent and really try to be persuasive. But if in the final analysis, everybody says, Roger, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> You better be willing to say, okay, uh, let me listen to you. Because um, I think I think arrogance, hubris, autocracy, those are the enemies of human progress. Um, and, and so as a leader, I've tried to be a good listener. Uh, I, I am, I am, I have ideas myself. I want to be a participant. I don't want to actually totally be the listener. I also want to be able to contribute. But I think part of the secret is to cultivate uh, good ideas wherever they come from. And, and uh, part of the leader's job is to know what are we trying to achieve in the biggest, biggest picture. And then you see someone doing something really amazing that's totally aligned with the big picture. And they don't even know it. They're just doing it because they love it or they believe in it. And you say, let's do more of that. And how do we take the organization's resources and uh, strength? and put them behind this project that could be so potentially exciting. Well, those are the qualities of, of any strong leader, everything that you just said. And, and not being afraid to surround yourself with other great people. I love surrounding myself with greatness. That's how I've had some of my best experiences in my life. And I'm certain it's the same for you with all of the organizations that you have created and been involved in. So one of, you know, one of the things that you and I have in common is we're the same age. So let's briefly take me back. You were talking about you've been playing drums since you were a little kid and playing in bands. Tell me about your early childhood and how growing up led you to the path of becoming the president of Berkeley, which is just like one of many stops along the way for you. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is you, your current job and your accomplishments are no greater here than they have been in the past with many other things that you've accomplished. And, and I, I'm certain you've failed at a few things too. You know, that's, that's oh. the sign of any great leader. If I could play drums like Peter Erskine, that's what I'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I grew up in this wonderful small town in the Northern part of Georgia, very near where the Appalachian trail begins. So if you're going to hike the whole trail, you're going to either start or end up right near my town of Gainesville. Um, and I had in many ways an idyllic childhood. I played little league baseball and sports and football and was in boy scouts and 
played a lot of music, sang in my church choir. Uh, I would say, in general, our schools were not very strong, but all the extracurricular activities and leadership activities were, were incredibly strong. Uh, if I compare it to the experience my children have had growing up in the Boston area, their schools were amazing. The stuff they could study was so far beyond what we could study. Um, on the other hand, they didn't have as many of these uh, enrichment experiences I had. Um, so uh, the other thing that I think is salient and it really uh, may be the most important thing about my childhood is that I grew up in a small southern town in the middle of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And as a white southerner, uh, like many of my friends, you're forced to confront the racism and the segregation. My, school, my elementary school was segregated. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I went to the first desegregated school when I was in seventh grade, and I, I do a class with our students about it, and they can't believe that. They think that was like thousands of years ago. It was one generation ago. That's right. Um, and it was the contemporary music of that era that, that changed my life. I have a, a little observation about my musical taste that I, uh, I first – heard James Brown singing Say It Aloud, I'm Black and I'm Proud when I was in middle school, Powerful. right after our schools had been desegregated. Right. James Brown is from Georgia, and I've always been a very tribal person, so I thought, okay, it's he's my one of us. Right. Yeah. And then I, I, I really loved the song by Neil Young, Southern Man, mm -hmm. that really excoriates the racism and, and hip, hypocrisy of white Southern Christian culture that talks about loving your neighbor and, you know, mm -hmm. creates uh, a system of slavery and segregation and discrimination. And then the third piece in that chain was Sly and the Family Stone, Everyday People. So the James Brown song gave me this, uh, this exposure to the rage of black Americans. And it's like, wow, this is serious stuff. And I, I was like, 12 years old or something. You know what and, turned me upside down? Gil Scott Heron, The Revolution Will Not yeah, Be Televised. Yeah, Just to yeah, add that to, yeah. the, to your wonderful list. The, 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 I, I didn't get turned on to that until I was in college. Got it. <laughs> that really would have turned me upside down. <clears throat> yeah, no more white tornadoes. Yeah, that was, that probably would have pushed me over the edge. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the, the first was a song, I, I think, of, of frustration and rage and and pride and identity. And the second, the Southern man was a song about sort of the guilt and um, shame uh, of, 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 of the way the world was organized and, and my part sort of being complicit in that. And then hmm. everyday people was a song of hope. Like, right. okay, we, we can, we can do something about this by a, a, a an interracial band that had women playing horns, you know, like it was, it was the vision of what the world could look like. So um, I, I had, in many ways, as I said, a, a, a very sweet childhood. I didn't, I didn't, you know, musically, I did a lot of music, but I never imagined that a person could be a musician. Hmm. It seemed to me that all the musicians came from some other place, and there weren't role models. What did your mom and dad do for a living? My dad was an engineer, mm -hmm. and... Uh, worked designing and building bridges and highways and he actually helped design and build the Atlanta airport. Hmm. Um, and then my mother had been a school teacher, but when I was born, stopped teaching and uh, became a very focused parent. I just lost my mom about oh, six weeks ago. I'm so sorry. Uh, she was a really driven, energetic, um, demanding person who was determined that I was going to have a different life than she had had. Um, well, she accomplished that. She did. She did. Uh, some with a vengeance. <laughs> um, so, so my grandmother was a really fantastic pianist and had played for silent movies and could pick up things by ear. And even though, you know, it wasn't her generation, she would hear like a Beatles tune on the radio and come home and just sit down at the piano and pick it out. Um, and her father, uh, my great grandfather had been a fiddler in the mountains of North Carolina. So 
a lot of music in the family. My mother had played trombone in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Wow, that's cool. As a young woman, but she said she was third chair, and she was only in it because they needed they needed to fill out the the orchestra. But I still think that's a pretty cool accomplishment for a, for a young woman. Were you encouraged to play music, or or were you encouraged in a way as the same way you were encouraged to join the Boy Scouts and play with your friends and? Just Not really, active. but I didn't need encouragement. I just, uh, I gravitated towards music from the earliest age, mm -hmm. and I formed this band in fifth grade. Perfect. So obviously no one was encouraging me to have a band in fifth grade. <laughs> so I, it was just somehow something I was drawn to, and probably like most musicians, if I went to a restaurant or someplace and there was a guitar or a drum set or a band set up, I just, I would just go hang out and look and see what the equipment was and try to imagine what the music was going to sound like based on the instrumentation. Uh, and I didn't get to hear a lot of live music uh, in this little town, but when I did, it was very exciting. Um, so I felt like I was surrounded by music, but I never really imagined. And it's a bit of a regret of mine. I think had I had the ability to conceive of a life as a musician, I might've followed a different path and, I always think, what would have happened had I discovered like the Berkeley summer program and mm. gone to that? I might have, I might have turned tail and run back to Gainesville <laughs> and said, I can't hack it with these people. Or I might have said, wow, this is great. Look at all these opportunities. And I think that I, if, if I, if I were to do it all over again, I would focus on songwriting. I feel like that's, that's, uh, that's what I love the most and where I feel like I have the most, uh, maybe inherent talent. Well, I would say to you, I would offer this up that it's not too late. I know that you are, this is your last year as president of Berkeley uh, that was planned. That has nothing to do with the pandemic or anything else. What is your plan? I mean, and do you have another job lined up or do you want to take some time and write some songs? And, and why don't you? Yeah, well, I am working on a couple of songs right now. Um, so I don't have a plan. Uh, that's nice that's to hear purpose yeah uh, it's, it, it's purposeful i have been doing this job for 16 years and despite all my protestations about balance you know i work pretty hard so i want to take a little time and clear the decks and try to imagine what would be good to do next uh that would uh be an interesting new chapter i mean the whole re if i wanted to keep doing what berkeley's all about I would just stay at Berkeley, mm -hmm. but it feels like after 16 years, I went to the school and myself to, to, uh, help bring about the next generation of leadership. So I have a bunch of ideas inside the music world, uh, you know, maybe, uh, affiliating with or, or getting involved with a small label or some kind of artist development effort. I feel like given my relationship with Berkeley, I have a, an amazing window on the flow of talent into the into the world of music um i've got a couple of friends that we've talked about doing some kind of festivals mm -hmm. um that would uh that would be fun and keep us connected to music and art but then i've got a bunch of ideas that are totally as you know my career has not been the linear one i've never felt constrained by needing to do something i know how to do i've, I've a couple of times just said this is interesting let me go try to do it so i don't know now I saw a quote from somebody else, and they made reference to you being a physics and math teacher at their school when they were growing up. Yeah. It surprised me a little, and then I realized I shouldn't be surprised because of the, the very eclectic path that it appears that you've taken. But in some way, it's been a pretty straight line because you do things that are of a giving um, nature. You do things to make the world a better place. You know, whether it's through education and teaching or whether it's through going to Africa to sponsor a program that you've been part of developing. I would say that the the the, uh, the code to my decision making has been, is it going to be interesting, exciting, adventuresome? And can I learn from it? And B, is it something that I believe the world needs more of? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not. I'm not naive to think that there's some silver bullet that if I went and did this, it would fix all the problems of the world. I kind of learned that early on doing refugee relief work where you can save tens of thousands of lives, but the, the country can, 
can spiral right back into the next famine or or uh, government sponsored genocides that you just can't control as as one individual or even working for an organization. So you develop a certain kind of humility that's like, okay, I can't fix the world personally. I can be involved with people who care about it. But then at some point you just have faith and you say, look, there are people who came before us who believe the world could be better. And uh, my example with my children was Frederick Douglass, who was, uh, you know, had this amazing life only to see slavery dismantled and then the country slip out of reconstruction back into one of its darkest periods. And he had to endure and witness all that. And I'm sure he must have felt the powerlessness of, of uh, both the excitement of, of the Emancipation Proclamation combined with uh, the, the rise of the KKK and white citizens councils. So none of us can, you know, can single-handedly uh, move the needle on the, the, the quality of the experience for 7 billion people in the world. But you do, you do want to be on the side of something you, you'll be proud of. Hmm. And that when your great grandchildren read about what you did, they'll say, wow, that was cool. As opposed to, Oh, what was he thinking? And that's something I say to our students, because especially in music, dance, theater, there's so much terror. Like, will I ever be successful? Will I be able to do this? How do I earn a living? They've been told by all their family and friends, like, this is a really hard path. You know, how are you going to earn a living? So I think there's this deep level of anxiety that makes people sometimes too willing to do things that they don't believe in. So the thing I say to students is imagine 10 years from now that you have been very successful. Are you proud of what you've done? Successful in, in the world's eyes, but are you proud of it? Is this what you want to be? Have the confidence that you're going to find a way to contribute in the world and then say, is that really what the world needs from me? Uh, so that you don't make compromises or, or, or get drawn into doing things that you don't really believe in. And ultimately, I think a lot of the artists we respect most are the ones who had a clear vision for themselves, who had that self-confidence that I will figure this out somehow. Um, and, you know, and you may not, I, I was thinking about the title of your show, Making It. You know, for an artist, making it is not being rich. It's making things. It's creating things. It's yeah. having a song that you wrote that someone else finds meaningful. Absolutely. It helps them in their life some way. So to me, making it is much more about, you know, have you made something and contributed in some way that you're, that you feel like is worthy of, of the life you've been given. And that, there's a lot of clarity in what you just said, and, and I'm in complete agreement. You know, that's that has guided me through my life. I want to do things that I am proud of mm -hmm. and, yeah. and do them with integrity, with passion, um, with consideration of the people around me. And, and, uh, and it's almost axiomatic that the, the hyper success that some artists achieve is not healthy for them. Yeah. It doesn't make point. them happy. <laughs> Forget about making the world better. <laughs> so you want to, in fact, I, I made this, I gave a speech to the, in, the International Bluegrass Music Association. I said, the wonderful thing about bluegrass is you can't be so successful that you start being self-destructive. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, very few bluegrass artists throw televisions out of, out of uh, hotel rooms or you know I'm, I'm sure i'm sure they had their own struggles but it, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't have that that uh kind of hollywood rock star set of temptations and and uh self-destructive behaviors that i think come sometimes with with fame and material success without meaning you know that leads me to something i w was thinking about asking you in our conversation which is that you have had front row seat access to a lot of very high profile people, not just musicians and artists, but people in all aspects of business. Are there certain qualities or common traits and qualities that you've noticed uh, that you think add to the success of those people? I tell you, I have an observation that I, again, try to share with students, which is for some reason, we're fascinated by the enigmatic, angry artist. And we tend to think all really successful artists are these curmudgeonly <laughs> people who are impossible to get along with and make horrible demands on others around them. 
and there are, I have encountered a few of those people, but I, I would say nine out of 10 are totally the opposite. They're, they're the kindest, most thoughtful, humble, generous hearted people you can imagine. Abe LaBrielle, I mean, he comes to mind as yeah. a prototype of that, but Herbie Hancock comes to mind, uh, Pat Metheny, um, Terry Lynn Carrington, who I get to work with at Berkeley. These are, these are, these are really caring, compassionate people who take their art seriously. And, uh, they're not, I mean, I'm sure they have their moments as we all do. If, you know, if you're going through airport security and getting <laughs> harassed for the thousandth time in a week, but, uh, in general, uh, I think the stereotype of the really awful disgruntled artist is is wrong. Many of the most successful people I've been around are just the opposite. So let's talk about something that's happening right now in the world that we can't ignore, and it's the current world health situation. Yeah, which you are, you know, on the front lines of right now as an educator. How do you no view? Kidding. Yeah, man. How do you view the current pandemic world situation from both a personal and educational point of view? Well, I have some interesting experience, life experiences that uh, contribute to my understanding of this, which is I've had three cases of malaria, hmm. uh, two Vivax malaria cases, which hmm. are not so – they're horrible, but they don't kill you. But one case of falciparum malaria, which is the kind that can really kill you um, – I've had dengue fever. I, I've had a lot of strange and, and debilitating illnesses, largely from the work I've done. And uh, I survived them. Now, not everybody does. Uh, and I am a student of history. And as much as I think this pandemic is scary and, uh, and, and unsettling and is going, to, is going to make a lot of people sick and is going to kill way too many people, if I compare it with what our ancestors went through, mm. who've been through plagues and famines and genocides and wars and all sorts of natural disasters and just, just the most kind of abject poverty where there is no safety net. Um, and, and I think all, every single one of us can say that. You don't just have to have had an ancestor at Auschwitz or an ancestor in the potato famine to be able to make that claim. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't get here easily. Our, our, our sure. forebears had to endure enormous hardships. And by definition, they survived long enough to procreate and have us. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I'm just trying to channel that deep history of, of uh, the human spirit that, that has allowed us to survive through things that are worse than this, as bad as this is. Um, and, um, you know, I think art and music is one of the tools we use to deal with it. I, I just this morning posted, uh, the Mavis Staples version of hard times come again, no more. It features uh Berkeley pianist, Matt Rawlings on the piano. Mm -hmm. And it's such a beautiful song. And, you know, Stephen Foster gets the writing credit. I suspect he, he took it out of the ether somehow. It was probably a folk tune that he reinterpreted and then mavis uh just crushes it and that song is all about those hardships so i guess my first observation is we got to be strong and channel the strength that comes from our from our own history um, the second observation is we also should be smart i mean <laughs> what allowed our ancestors to survive is that they 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 obviously had coping strategies so Right now, we were one of the first schools to say, we need you to go home. Right. You were we you definitely one of the first. Absolutely. Yeah. And we got some grief for that. And we were one of the first to say, why don't you take your belongings home out of the dorms? Because we don't think you're coming back this semester. And lo and behold, that was prescient because a lot of people at, at other colleges can't even get back to get their belongings. Mm -hmm. We are lucky that... Um, even before I got to Berkeley, my predecessor, Larry Burke, and, and his colleague, Gary Burton, had created the Berkeley Online experience. It was still very nascent when I got there, and I have been a big believer in that program, and Debbie Cavalier, who runs it, is just amazing, and her team is amazing. So we're now teaching thousands of students online uh, every day, long before the pandemic. Right, you're already doing it. 
offering bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and credit bearing courses accredited by the same people who accredit MIT and Harvard and the Berkeley physical campus. So, so the second thought is, okay, how do we be crafty, smart, intelligent, respond to this? Uh, don't just wring our hands and feel bad. What do we do to make the most of it? Um, I, I sort of facetiously observed the other day that we may never have another snow day. Hmm. Because we used to have to close when it was a snow day and then those. Re, re, reschedule and make up classes. Well, we now know how to do this virtually. It's not it's not an incredibly hard thing to do. It's it's not what you'd want to do. You want to be together if you can. Um, so how do we make the most of this? And then the third and maybe most important thing is um, when people are under pressure, usually it either brings out the best or the worst. So how do we make sure it's the best? You know, how do we how do we care and love each other more through this than we would have ordinarily, uh, as opposed to turning against each other? And there are going to be some hard decisions mm -hmm. we, we've already made and are going to have to make going forward. We just had to to create a virtual commencement. That's very disappointing to a lot of our students because mm -hmm. our commencements are epic events. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, so I totally understand the disappointment. On the other hand. There's no way we're going to have a physical commencement in May. It's just it's just not going to happen. Uh, and we're going to try to do something in the fall or winter where we get everybody together again and by division to try to replicate some of the intimacy that you get from those commencements. But anyway, so uh, how do we how do we make the most of this and, and you know be our best selves? I've been speaking to some other educators, uh, Peter Erskine uh, being one of them at USC. My wife's mother, Althea Waits, is a classical pianist, and she works for uh, Cal State Long, Long Beach in the classical music department. Some of the teachers are having challenges right now. Ironically, colleges, high schools seem to be a little mm -hmm. bit more set up, mm -hmm. junior high school, high school, elementary school, for um, online interaction. But are there any resources that are available to them just to kind of speed up the learning curve for them to teach by Zoom and any of the other, any suggestions in general for them? I have been astounded at how well the faculty at Berkeley and Boston Conservatory have, have adapted themselves and their teaching to this new environment. It really is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what most music teachers would tell you is that students would all be a little better off if they listened more, <laughs> maybe. You know, we always think the key is that extra hour of practice. But listening is maybe the single most important skill. You can still listen. And right now with streaming, you can listen to anything, anywhere. You can transcribe. You can still produce. There are a lot of things you can do. So again, I hope this doesn't last too long, mm -hmm. but I think a resourceful teacher can find a, a ton of things for students to do that are productive and useful and maybe even a nice complement to what we tend to do when left our own devices, mm -hmm. which is which is we play or we practice. Sometimes we practice less efficiently than we probably should. So how do we use this time to like go back to basics? develop our own critical listening skills, maybe open our, ourselves to new kinds of music or new art forms we didn't know before. And then ultimately, the artists we admire most were not necessarily the greatest virtuosos, but they were the people who had the most to say. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually sit in the experience and make something out of it that's, that's meaningful to people? Like that song, Hard Times, you know, that, that's the perfect song for the moment, in my opinion. How do you write the next one of those? Uh, and you're not going to write it if you're just uh, sort of sleepwalking through this. No, you can have all the technique in the world. And if you've got nothing to say, then it, it's it's almost pointless. It certainly doesn't yeah. hit the target of moving people. It's impressive. It's impressive. Yes. But it's sort of like someone playing scales at very high, temp fast tempos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's switch gears for a second. There's There's a few programs that you've been involved in through Berkeley that I just want to talk briefly about that caught my attention. One is the Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, which mm -hmm. is to inspire the advancement of disruptive ideas through the application of musical creativity and cross-discipline collaboration. I wish that we had that class when I was in school. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that came about and, and what you're doing with that briefly. 
Well, look at what you're doing. Hmm. You're doing podcasts with musicians you care about, sharing them with other people. That's creative entrepreneurship. It's sort of looking at the tools and materials that exist around you and saying, how do I create with these? It's a recognition that every single person who starts a band or opens their own studio or even has a little teaching studio where they teach private lessons is an entrepreneur. And there's a business dimension to what they're doing that is important and will affect the quality of the, the art they help create. So, and it's also a recognition that entrepreneurs in more traditional fields can learn from the skills and practices of musicians and creators. So uh, some of the things we've been talking about, the ability to, to practice in such a way that at the right moment you can improvise. Uh, that's what most, most of life is. You know, <laughs> it, 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 the era of believing that you could have a five-year plan that was in any way meaningful is long gone. Um, so how does the entrepreneur, the traditional entrepreneur, learn from the, from the artist? And how does the creative artist learn to see herself or himself more as, as an entrepreneur and take some of those skills of prototyping new ideas and testing things and seeing what works and what doesn't work and being willing to change and pivot and improvise and try to find something that is disruptive in, in the sense that the world wants and needs it uh, more than all the, the, the offerings that are out there. Those are really key skills. And, and I think many alums have the same reaction you've had, which is I'm not sure I knew I needed that then, because again, back then you just wanted to get better on your 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 act, right? But at some point you say, well, okay, you know, <laughs> that can only take you so far. I need a gig. I need to put some food on the table. Uh, I need creative. Ideas. And we've all seen people. You go to school with people, and then you see them go out in the world. And some people are just so like uh, Steve Vai is a great example. Mm -hmm. Yes, Steve Vai to me is is the creative entrepreneur. No one no one doubts the proficiency of his musicality and what he's created, but he's done it in a way that is, you know, he, he's, he's an, uh, an enterprising human being. Absolutely. Where I was just with the, I was just with the dream theater guys. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a very entrepreneurial band that they didn't follow the playbook. No. Um, um, and so, for, the, for those that don't know, Steve Vai, for example, really kind of put his, got his foot in the door through transcribing Frank Zappa solos and then, Frank wanted to meet him. Yeah. You know, I have found in my career, and I've seen it in your career through all the various things that you've done, that it's important to be open to something yeah. maybe coming in through a side door that you hadn't expected. And when that door opens, don't just walk right by it. You know, look and see what's inside of it and step into it. Do what's being asked and do more. In my life, everything has come from the side. Mine too. <laughs> I, I've never, I've never walked in the front door of anything uh, that I can think of. It's all been, and I think that's true for, for most people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think of the Berkeley job. I, I'd been running this company called Bright Horizons, which does childcare based at workplaces, and it was very successful. And I'd been doing a lot of children's music for fun. Mm -hmm. Um, because I had a, a willing audience to listen to me. And um, and I wanted to do something else. I'd been doing that for about 16 years. So I thought, what should I do? And, and I happened to pick up a copy of the Chronicle of Higher Education. It was on my wife's desk. And I read it. And I read about the presidency of Berkeley. And I had taken drum lessons from Tommy Campbell, a very famous, amazing drummer who mm -hmm. was teaching at Berkeley at the time. I revered people like Gary Burton and uh, many of my favorite drummers. In fact, I'm doing a Facebook series now of seminal drum grooves created by Berkeley alums. Oh, fantastic. So, I got to yeah, check so that you out. You have to check it out. I will. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I revered the place and, and my first thought was, I want to do that job, but would they ever hire me? Would I be able to do it? Uh, that was a total side door. Mm -hmm. now, I read about the job in a, in a newspaper. <laughs> Randomly, um, yes. Yeah, randomly. And I think if people are honest with themselves, and, and sometimes we, we go back and we reconstruct the narrative that says, oh, I had this brilliant idea, and then I did it. Usually, you had a million ideas, 999,000 of which were terrible, 
And if you had any success, it's because you happened to stumble into the right one. Yeah. Guilty as charged. Absolutely. And grateful for those side doors opening. And for me somehow having the intuition, that might be something that I should consider saying yes to. You know, yeah. saying, you know, saying no is a really invaluable skill. It's certainly in the context of not allowing yourself to be taken advantage of in business, et cetera. Right. However, the skill of saying yes um, and, and the importance of it, as a matter of fact, I, you know something, I had just remembering this, I wrote an editorial for the Berkeley magazine years ago and it, and I think it was about saying yes, I'll have to go yeah. look, I'll look for that again. But, but it was talking about my experiences, the big ones, my career experiences that came to me because of my openness and willingness to do something that wasn't really in my plan. Yeah, right. I think that's a huge, important point. And the, and the wisdom to know which are the ones you should say no to mm -hmm. versus which are the ones where you should say, okay, let's give this a try. Yeah. That's, that may be the essential life skill because you don't, as you, as you say, you don't want to say yes to everything. People will take advantage of you and exploit you. Or you might say yes to something you're just absolutely not equipped to do and fail miserably. And, but I think more often than not, people hold themselves back because they deep at some deep level they're insecure mm -hmm. that they won't be able to figure it out or do it or they you know they've been coached I, I think in the music world we coach young people so much to not be exploited and almost every musician I know was exploited in the first thing they did right absolutely <laughs> almost nobody gets a great contract record deal <laughs> the, the, the first time you know you, you almost have to you have to go through proving yourself and then you have the leverage to say, no, I don't want that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I also think sometimes we, we may uh, prepare our students to be so risk averse and so careful not to be exploited. Hey, if you, if you know, if you wrote a song and some famous artist will release it, if they get a co-writing credit, I'm not saying you should say yes, but I'm also not saying you should definitely say no. Right. Uh, Agreed. Because the the next song you write, you you know, you may have a lot more bargaining power if the if the first song you wrote in in that collaboration, quote unquote, uh, becomes very popular. So, I just think you have to use your own instincts and follow your own moral compass about. I, I would say, is it exciting to you? Does it give you energy? Does it make you want to wake up in the morning and go do it? That's valuable, whether you're getting paid a lot or not for it. On the other hand, if you're getting paid a lot, but it's it's horrible and you feel like a, a bad person for doing it or you're demoralized by it or you feel like it's not what you want to be doing, that you know, that's, that's a, a signal as well. We're talking about successes, but let's let's just talk about some of the failures because as you and I have both failed in, in some things that we've attempted, do you have any regrets or, or are there any fails that you feel weren't positive to your, your path? Oh, you know, I think I have a remarkable ability to, to, to forget my failures. <laughs> <laughs> and that may, there may be something there, uh, which is that, no, the, I, I love sports. I grew up playing sports. And, and the athletes who amaze me are the ones who can make a totally boneheaded play <laughs> and come right back out there and be more self-confident than they were before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Steph Curry, is, uh, I'm a big Steph Curry fan. That guy can miss uh, a shot, and it, it does not seem to have an iota of impact <laughs> on his self-confidence that he's going to make the next one. And Tom Brady, our, our, our former New England Patriots quarterback, mm -hmm. his he had this indomitable spirit where, you know, he could throw a pick six and then come back and be ready to ready to rock and roll. So I think there is something healthy and not um uh lamenting your failures too much. Mm -hmm. I probably could remember them better and learn <laughs> from them more. But um you know, I, I I've had I you know there's so many so many things. I, I have a lot of uh, wistfulness about paths not taken. Mm -hmm. um, things I, I wish I had done that I didn't get a chance to do. It's not so much that I, that I wish I hadn't done something that failed. It's more I wish I had the chance to try some other things 
uh, even beyond what I've done. And I do feel blessed. I've had a very rich life and most of it's worked out pretty well. But, um, you know, uh, being around so many amazing musicians, it does make me think, what if, what if I had, it, you know, at age 16 said, you know, go for it and had the, had the confidence and the, the perseverance that I've applied to other things. Um, and the international development work I've done, uh, you know, running a refugee camp is, mm -hmm. is very complicated. There's a reason why people end up in refugee camps and it's because all the systems in their country don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if things, if infrastructure is working, people don't end up in refugee camps, but it's when you have a war, a civil war in a place like Syria that millions of people have to flee. By definition, they flee to places that don't have water supplies or housing. They come from different places. They give each other diseases they haven't been exposed to before. You're ill-equipped to take care of them because they're obviously not in a place that has infrastructure. There's poverty. People don't have resources. Even if they had resources before they fled, they don't. So, uh, you know, the, the, the art of surviving and working and managing in a, in a resource-deprived environment like that is really helpful because you just have to you have to say, well, okay, this is not ideal. What are we going to do about it? Before we get to our closing questions, I wanted to just ask you briefly about the Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice program that you put together with Terry Lynn Carrington. Well, I am such a huge fan of Terry's. I have said to anybody who will listen that uh, I feel like one of my major achievements at Berkeley was I'd been a big fan of hers long before I got the job. Mm -hmm. And of course, I knew she had gone to Berkeley uh, as, a, I think, a 14-year-old or something. Yeah, we were there around the same um, time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've met many people who decided to stop playing drums because <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they met Terry when she was 14 or 15. Uh, um, so I... Uh, I flew out to LA. I had, you know, there's always stuff to do in LA with Berkeley alums. And I had lunch with her at her home. And I said, Terry, is there any chance you would consider coming back to Berkeley? And her dad, Sonny had coached me on this a little bit. I said, I need you to be my co-conspirator here. He said, I'll help you, but I think she's pretty stuck in LA. Uh, and she, she looked at me and she said, you know, I've been thinking that I might want to go back to the East coast at some point, be around my family. You know, I, I care about Berkeley. I'd love to be involved in helping you. And lo and behold, it happened. So, hmm. so then uh, Terry had been had been pitching us on an idea of something that would um, um, really address one of I think the most shocking oversights in jazz, which is jazz has always been this musical form that gave a voice to people who were largely uh, powerless in society. Uh, particularly coming out of the African-American experience. But within jazz, it's got its own problems, mm -hmm. which are that women have largely been silenced, and even super talented women who had a lot to offer as players or composers either got relegated to smaller roles or supportive roles, ne never had the opportunities that men have had. And Terry was, I think, becoming aware of this herself, having had so much success as a female drummer on one of these, the most male dominated instruments in the, in, uh, in jazz. Absolutely. There's a part of her that's like, Hey, I don't want to be seen as a woman. I just want to be a great drummer and I want to stay away from all this gender stuff. And I think she got to a level of her own career and development where she said, why am I still one of the only ones? Something wrong with this picture. And thank God I had people like my father and Clark Terry and others who took an interest in me and, kind of helped open the Red Sea for me, but a lot of people don't have that. And a lot of them never even have, have the chance to get to where I got as a young woman, much less have the career I've had. So she became very passionate about this, and she came to Larry Simpson, our provost, and me with this idea, and we said, man, that is a great idea. That's a way for you to have an impact, not only on the school, but way beyond the school, and it's something that needs to happen. And then lo and behold, we went out and found a lot of donors who think it's an important idea. So it, it has garnered a lot of philanthropic support. A lot of other artists are excited about it. And Terry's idea is not just how do we support the growth of young women or non-binary people in jazz, but it's how do we train young men 
to be supportive and be open to hearing the voices of, of others and the, the expression of others. So she's got a beautiful conception of it. And you can read a lot of her materials about it, but I think it's having a huge impact on us. And she's got an idea of creating a, a like a, a, a new real book because the real book, hmm, right. uh, other than Carla Blay and a f- few women, it's largely, again, a male dominated uh, world. So where are all the standards that, that, that women have written that might be, uh, shared with the next generation of That's players. A great so idea. Got a bunch of great ideas. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, give a shout out also to the Power Station Recording Studio in New York. About a year ago, uh, maybe two years ago, I was asked to produce a song that Charlie Fox and Paul Williams wrote for a documentary that came out this past year called The Bronx. And it was the title mm-hmm. song. We recorded it and filmed it in New York. And I was asked to put a New York group of musicians together and fly out and record. And, you know, I knew that you had taken over the studio and it was, and so I called Berkeley and and got a contact and called New York and we worked it out and it was great. Our experience was amazing. It was so, such a thrill to be back in the studio. I My last time there was when I was a student at Berkeley, and I went with Michael Gibbs, who was my composing teacher, and he was doing a session yeah. there, and I went. And, and so it just it, it took me right back to that college experience of watching this amazing record get made. But the studio is up and running, and it's fantastic. And I just find it very exciting that you have figured out a way to collaborate once again, outside of the box. I mean, there is no box anymore for anything. Right. But the fact that that you don't even consider that, that you just look at an iconic studio and, and see it as an asset and an opportunity, <clears throat> not just for, for the school and not just for the studio, but for everything. It's very, um, everybody benefits. And we benefited from having the opportunity to record there and recorded this fantastic song that ended up in a documentary. So kudos for that. Thanks for doing that. And and thank you to you and your team for making us feel so welcome. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I got so much support from the musician community about saving that place. Yeah. I remember, I remember Antonio Sanchez called me up and said, this place is a temple, man. Thank you for, for saving it. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's the here's the cool backstory. We had thought about, you know, someday creating a, a micro campus in either Los Angeles or New York, because those are still two very dominant cities in the music industry. That's where many of our alumni go. And the thought had occurred to us that you've got all these iconic studios that often are closing because the, the world has changed so much mm-hmm. and they don't have as much business as they used to. And so one thought was, man, if we could get the timing right and find a philanthropist who would support us, what if we bought one of those studios on its way out and turned it into this micro campus? Um, so that, that idea we had had maybe 10 years ago, and we'd looked into a few things. Then lo and behold, I had this new board member, wonderful musician named Pete Muller, who also has a day job as a hedge fund manager and is in, incredibly successful but very devoted to his music and he said hey you know my my producer is a berkeley alum he was telling me about power station it was called avatar that was uh, the avatar era it's going to be closing probably turning into condos would berkeley be interested in it and i said absolutely because we already had the template in our heads we'd already worked out what this would look like so it would operate as a commercial studio but at the same time we'd be teaching both undergraduates and graduates, we'd have people who want to move to New York coming there doing residencies and internships. Um, and we would use the fact that it's a commercial studio as, as uh, an opportunity for some of the teaching. Obviously, if a high-level session does not want any student involvement, that's fine. Mm-hmm. They can have that. But to the extent they're open to, to students getting a learning experience, what better way to learn than be in an iconic world-class studio where – all these amazing records were done. So uh, we had this, we had the template in our heads and, and it just all fell together. And we we're in the middle of renovations. We had to stop construction, but uh, if all goes well, we should be open sometime this fall uh, with a, with a, with a facility that's renovated where it needed to be because mm-hmm. the roof was leaking and the HVAC was like a, a thousand years old. 
and they had plastered over some of the windows. So we're going to renovate the stuff that needs to be, but we're trying to not touch the sonic spaces because everyone said, you mess those up and we're coming for you. Oh, it's magic. Because yeah. 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 It's to me, it, it, uh, in its own very unique way, it, it equals our studio out here at Capitol. You know, yeah. that's just, there's, there's magic in the walls. There's a history. Yeah, there, there are a few like that where you just, you know, the importance in the history of, of recorded music is just impossible to overstate. And now, now it's our home. <laughs> that's so fantastic. Yeah. Man, you must be really proud of that one. I'm so proud. Yeah. And I also think we haven't even begun. I had a board member who's very smart. Uh, I, I really admire this guy. And he said, there will be emergent opportunities that you don't even know about. And he's so right. Once you have an asset like that, that's literally a, a 10 minute walk from Broadway mm -hmm. where every Broadway cast recording has been done. And suddenly you merge with Boston conservatory, which is one of the best schools in the world at putting people on Broadway. We had not even imagined that connection. So one of the things we hope to teach at power station is writing musical theater, which is something that the Boston conservatory, the focus has been more on performing and acting what better place to do it than where all the cast recordings are done and literally within a stone's throw of, of Broadway. Well, and just the very fact that, that you are so open minded and hearted to collaborating with another university, not seeing it as a competitor, but as an asset really intrigues me. You know, you, you're, you are just fearless in not worrying about the minutia of things. If an idea is good, you move forward with it and figure out how to, to best implement it. Yeah, you know, I mean, we make this point all the time. You see it with the coronavirus. I think a lot of Americans had this idea, oh, this is a thing that's in China. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the borders and boundaries we create are artificial. Yeah, yes. And viruses don't respect them. And so a lot of the boundaries we create in organizations and the territorialism and, okay, this is theater and this is music and this is dance and they're artificial. When I went to see Hamilton, I thought, okay, here's the future. This, this is a musical theater production that really has envisioned a world with no, with none of the artificial boundaries mm -hmm. that we've historically had. So yeah, I try to think that way. Uh, being respectful of the fact that, you know, we do organize ourselves into organizations and there, you have to think about how people will work together and get along. But the merger between Berkeley and Boston conservatory has been incredibly successful and one of the points I've made to the Boston Conservatory colleagues, some of whom at first were a little worried and skeptical, <laughs> is I said, do you know why there's a dance program at Boston Conservatory? Because most conservatories don't have dance programs. And most people didn't know. In the late 1800s, there was a fire and a dance studio in Boston got burned out of its space. And it asked Boston Conservatory if it could share some space. <laughs> Great. And they said, sure, you can have this floor. <laughs> and lo and behold, eventually they said, why don't we merge? So the, 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 the conservatory itself was the result of a merger <laughs> way back all, uh, over 100 years ago. That kind of thinking and the kind of thinking that you have been implementing, I would imagine that some of that comes from you needing to learn how to be resourceful when you're sitting on a dirt floor in Kenya trying to figure out how to get clean water to a village. Yeah, I think that, that part of what Kenya in particular taught me is how much you can do with so little. Mm -hmm. You know, the people in this village I was teaching in had almost no resources by the way we measure them. But they were happy, resourceful, hardworking, enjoyed their lives in a way that I think often some of us in, in this country have forgotten how to do. And it was just a wake up call for me about, um, I don't know, you know, the, the, the commonality of the human experience and, and how much we can do if we have the vision and uh, persistence mm -hmm. to do it. That was a very influential year for me. I can um, imagine. I was living in a, I was living in a small, um, little house that had no plumbing and no electricity. And, um, I was, um, teaching 
stuff that I barely knew myself. Uh, they, they needed a chemistry teacher at the school, and I had never really formally studied much chemistry. I'd done a lot of math and physics mm-hmm. and biology. So I was like every night trying to learn the next day's lesson. Uh, but it, and, and I read a lot of books. Uh, I read, I probably read two books a week. And so it was, it was just an amazing education for me. Did you get to have any uh, drum experiences there? I did. I did. I, 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 I had a little kind of homemade set of bongos I made from two indigenous drums that I connected together with uh, mm-hmm. some cut up inner tubes. And I played in this gospel choir. <laughs> and of course, I, there were not many uh, Caucasians in this village. So I was a real object of curiosity. <laughs> so uh, when I showed up with the band, we got more attention than we deserved. Um, and then I played some drums with, there was a, a, a military band that played uh, traditional kind of Congolese music. Um, and I played some with them which was a real, real interesting thing because the music, it sounds pretty simple, uh, at least what the drummer is doing. But the, the, the subtle uh, ghost strokes and inflections and accenting is quite different. You know, the, they feel the groove very differently. And it was, it was really interesting to feel like, okay, I feel like I'm playing the notes, but it doesn't sound like it's supposed to sound. So like, what's missing? How do I... How do I really hear the music better and figure out what's going on and retrain myself, get out of some of these habits that I'm in of the way I'm doing access and stuff. So, yeah, I had some great musical experience. Everywhere I've gone, I, when I was mm-hmm. in uh, Sudan, there was a cover band in Khartoum, and this guitar player could play the Sultans of Swing guitar solo note for note. <laughs> just It sounded just like Mark Knopfler. Mm-hmm. It had that same touch. When I was in Cambodia and Thailand, I played in this GB band. Uh, and I remember they loved that Billy Joel song, um, You May Be Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so wherever I was, I would find a band and, uh, and you know, play with them, sit in with them. And it's a, it's a great way to understand another culture. And, and uh, of course, I was kind of always a novelty uh being in those places. So. You know, it's reminding me, your stories are reminding me of another quote that I read. Uh, and I don't remember who the person was. You you might, but they were talking about the first time they had met you. They actually saw you in China in an audience. You were this tall white guy with long hair with a big grin on your face, not knowing the language or anything, but yeah, just yeah. out there dancing and having a great time. That was a, a famous Berkeley alum named Wang Li Hong, who was a superstar in China. Uh, and I became a big fan of his. I, I, what really happened is, is I, we started getting all these students from China. And I said, well, how did you find out about Berkeley? And everybody said, Wang Li Hong. I said, so I better figure out who this guy is. <laughs> and he's a monster. He's a superstar. And he's a super talented guy. Actually grew up in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And he went to Williams College and studied traditional liberal arts, including Mandarin. Hmm. He learned to speak Mandarin Chinese Here. at Williams College, wow. in Massachusetts. <laughs> and his music teacher at Williams had gone to Berkeley and said, you, if you're serious about this music thing, you should go to Berkeley. So he came to Berkeley for a while after he'd already finished college. Mm-hmm. And he had this explosive career, and he's a really sweet guy. And yeah, I was sitting in the audience, and I'm sure I stood out because the audience was about, a billion 15 year old Chinese girls, <laughs> this, you know, and with their cell phones in the air. And uh, I probably did stand out in that audience. I chuckled when I read the quote. He also yeah. said some other kind things about you. My closing questions that I want to get to, and then I'll give you the last word, of course. Uh, you already answered one of them earlier, and you answered it beautifully is what is making it mean to you, both personally and professionally? Mm-hmm. You're welcome to add to that but I think you covered it very clearly. The second part of that question is, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Hmm. I think we've talked about some of those too. Mm -hmm. I think being open to opportunities that are unexpected and having the self-confidence to believe that if there's something you don't know how to do, you can learn to do, you can teach yourself, or you can find other people who can do it. So you don't need to do it all yourself. Um, 
being persistent and willing to fight through hard times and know that you, you know, again, it's sort of, I, I always feel like I've been very insecure in the moment and very self-confident over the long term. So I sweat the details <laughs> right now. Like, what are we going to do tomorrow? But I know we're going to get through this. I know we're going to be fine. So that combination of like, you don't want to be so cool about everything's going to work out that you're lying around on the couch, just thinking it's going to happen naturally. <laughs> right. But, but having the, the, uh, the, the ability to say, okay, we are going to get through this again. Let's do, let's do it with grace. Let's do it in a way that when we look back, we say we did this the right way. So, um, uh, I think, but just, just seizing opportunities and, and, and having the, the, the sense of adventure. I mean, you know, life is short. I didn't think so when I was 16, but uh, where I'm sitting now, you know, you, you can, you see, you see the sand in the hourglass dripping out. And, yeah. and so what are you going to do with it? Uh, I think uh, Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets says, uh, so what are you going to do with your one wild and precious life? Hmm. Well, man, life is short. And that's got nothing to do with this pandemic, although it certainly um, brings it to yeah. the front burner right now. I did know that not at 16, but at 17 when I lost my dad in an accident. So that life is short mantra has sort of driven my path, you know, personally and, and professionally. And, and I agree with you. It is. And, and it's a precious gift. It's not to be wasted. Right. Uh, and to live it with the word that you use with grace, uh, mm -hmm. again, integrity, passion, mm -hmm. purpose, and not, and in some level of selflessness along the way. I mean, you get to be selfish along the way too, you know, but, um, I think that's important, Yeah. but all the things that you're saying are, um, have just ring really true to me, yeah. you know, hearing you say them. Well, um, Let's try to make the best of the of the remaining uh, grains of sand in the hourglass, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I would add to your list. You know, I, I say all your adjectives are good ones, but I would also say a little bit of a sense of whimsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, not take it so damn seriously. Right. Um, um, I think you have more fun when you can. Um, laugh at yourself, laugh at the circumstances, or if you can't laugh, at least say, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> what is, what is the universe throwing at me now? How am I going to deal with this? <laughs> my wife always taught, my wife was on the board of a, of a university, had a great president. And she said, whenever something really horrible had happened, say, now this is interesting. <laughs> you know, how do you approach things with this sense of, okay, there's a, here's a fun problem to solve. Right. It's a, yeah, I, it's definitely a very important ingredient to having a good life yeah. is, is yeah. keeping a sense of whimsy, like you said. Yeah. My, yeah. my closing question to you, Roger, is at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self growing up in Gainesville? Hmm. Try to just enjoy it all. Don't. I, I always feel like there's a part of me, I was like a young man in a hurry eager to get on to the next thing. So just calm down, enjoy it, you know, and, and, you know, like suck the marrow out of every moment. Um, remember it better, you know, don't be so eager to get on to the next thing. And I, that's still advice I could use. I'm still a very future oriented mm -hmm. person as opposed to a in the moment kind of person. There's a great James Taylor line from one of his more recent songs uh, that I that I used in a speech, so I remembered it. Went thin, thin. The moment is thin, ever so narrow. The now, everybody say, got to live in the day. Don't nobody know how. He's boy. He's a gift and a poet. Yeah, yeah. So. We know we need to do that. We know we need to treat every moment like it's precious. And whenever you're sick or something, you think, oh, God, if you help me get well again, I'm going to enjoy every moment of being healthy. And then you get healthy again and you, you know, some 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 mild annoyance, some someone driving badly gets under your skin and mm -hmm. you think, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't waste that moment on that emotion. I I pray that through this pandemic, when the world is 
has an opportunity and a requirement to unite um, that as we wake up, as people wake up and, and are become more conscious and conscientious that they stay woke yeah. when we get on the other side of this. I think it will change us in some fundamental ways. Mm -hmm. I think we've had a, a view that life owes us something, you know, that, um, and sadly it doesn't, you know, so it is what we make of it. And I hope it will bring us together. Uh, I think it, it, it has shown us that we can dramatically reduce our carbon emissions. <laughs> uh, you know, the, a lot of pollution in, in very polluted parts of the world has dissipated. So we can probably take better care of the planet as we take better care of ourselves. Uh, but it is going to also be a real struggle. I think all the people losing jobs, all the musicians who can't get gigs, um, it's, um, you know, it, it's going to be a, 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 a kind of a cleansing and uh, shocking experience for people. And I do hope when we come out of it, we'll be, we'll be better and stronger and maybe a little smarter. Well, on that note, uh, okay. I just want to say how much I've enjoyed speaking with you, Roger. And to all of our listeners, on behalf of Roger Brown and Berkeley College, my school, and myself, we want to thank you for joining us. And we wish you strength and clarity in being smart through this time. You know, everybody, yep. shelter down. Man, this is no joke. Yeah, take care of yourselves. Please take good care of yourselves. And from uh, our hearts, Roger and I both appreciate all of you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Terry. I've enjoyed this. Thank you, Roger. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wallman.